please, no noise, don't rattle. If you want to eat something, that's great, but don't snackle your snacks. Uh, remember not to get up and walk in front of the camera. If you go out a door or in a door, hold it so it doesn't make a noise because this is going to be used for the next 10 years and it's very distracting for someone that's online to have the distraction, okay? So with that. And if you don't want your uh, picture up on YouTube, don't turn around. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to get a theatrical release. All right. I mean, most of it, it's going to be up on me mostly, but just be aware of that. Oh, you want some water, too? Here, let me hear. Is Dominic here? Hey. Okay. Here, you have to sip coffee. You don't drink that water. But then it's All right. So we're going to start the ob obligatory class for a sex class, right, STDs. Uh, not anybody's favorite subject, I'm sure. Just a little bit of general information here. In the United States, about 19 million new infections are thought to occur each year. Uh, almost half of the new infections are between the ages of 15 and 24. Interestingly enough, another part of the age group that's really growing in STDs is older people in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s because they're moving into like retirement communities, they're still, they still want to be sexually active, they're finding new partners after their first husband may have died or first wife may have died. So they are um, going to the doctor's office with STIs with some frequency. Women are more affected by STIs than men are because we have nice warm places for those germs and viruses to grow. And so we have, we need to be a little bit more aware of that. Uh, men have just one hole, the urethra, where germs and viruses can get into. We have a couple. So the other thing about that is for women, uh, STIs can happen during pregnancy just like they can happen when you're not pregnant and they can affect the infant, so you need to be aware of that. There's a lot of STDs. Uh, we're not going to talk about all of them today. These are, this is probably not an exhaustive list. There, I'm sure there are more. Uh, we'll concentrate on a couple of the more common ones. <coughs> So particularly herpes, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, and then HPA, HPV and HIV. Yeah, uh, a lot of STIs cause what we call kind of cankerous sores on the penis or on the vagina. Infectious diseases in our body are caused by bacteria, viruses, fungus, and parasites. So those are the different categories. They love nice, warm, moist places, as I said. And for the infection to occur, pathogens, which this is all called pathogens, must enter the body through mucous membranes. So mouth, anywhere where you have a hole, you have mucous membranes. Okay. Um, if you have a cut, you would have mucous membranes under there. Um, so through the mucous membranes and form uh, that form protective linings, so split those areas. Pretty typically uh, it's contact uh, through semen, vaginal fluids, or blood. Close uh, body contact with full-blown uh, full sex tells these little pathogens like to live, in, live longer once they're out of your body and some of them can hang around for up to 72 hours. So, but most die pretty quickly. But if, like if you use towels, clothing, sheets right after somebody with an STI, it's possible. Sharing sex toys, sharing infective needles and razors, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Piercing stations, tattoo parlors, you need to be aware of what their techniques are in terms of sterilizing things and shaving. How you increase your chances, um, 
sexual activity at a young age, when you're first starting to have sex, you can be particularly susceptible to STIs because your body has no has fewer uh, immune, less immune strength, I should say, at younger ages. And uh, so young teenagers can get STIs fairly easily. Unprotected sex, lots of sexual partners, uh, and lack of testing so you don't know what's going on with your body. So we're going to talk about uh, chlamydia first. Grocery shoppers of America, take your O Organics baby carrots. Take your chips. Hi everybody, this is Kaylee, and today we're going to be talking about one of the worst possible downfalls of having unprotected sex, sexually transmitted disease, mm -hmm. chlamydia. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease caused by the bacterium strain called chlamydia trichomus. And unfortunately, this particular STD, when left untreated, can lead to serious, long, and short-term negative effects on reproductive health. So today, we're going to find out, A, how common is chlamydia and what are its symptoms? B, well, if you are infected, then what? What kind of treatment is available? 2.2 million U.S. citizens between ages 14 and 39 that are currently infected, most of whom don't even know this. That's because 50% of women and 75% of men who have chlamydia don't have any symptoms whatsoever and are unaware that they're infected. Now, for those who do have symptoms, usually appearing the one to three weeks after infection, infection, this is the not so fun part because they can include, include any of the following. Discharge from the genitals or pain while urinating, general bleeding and pain, and for some women, fever, nausea, and pain during sex. Chlamydia itself can be contracted through oral, anal, or vaginal sex and can manifest itself in the vagina, penis, throat, and anus. No bueno. So, if you are infected, well, then what? What kind of treatment is available? Being a bacterial disease as opposed to a viral disease, chlamydia is fairly easy to cure and treat once diagnosed. The CDC suggests that all women under 25 should go for regular yearly testing, all women over 25 with new sex partners should be tested, and all pregnant women should be tested for chlamydia in an effort to diagnose, treat, and prevent adverse effects from arising. So, once diagnosed, chlamydia can be treated with a single dosage of the antibiotic called doxycycline, and this usually lasts about a week. And during this time, most doctors suggest that all infected persons and their partners abstain from all forms of sexual activity. So, if left untreated, what kind of adverse complications can arise from exposure to chlamydia? Generally, treatment is fairly easy, and chlamydia can be cured. However, due to the fact that most men and women with chlamydia are completely unaware that they are infected, many adverse effects and complications can arise before knowledge of the infection is even, you know, there. And generally, for women, these effects are more serious. Men rarely, if ever, have complications from exposure to chlamydia. However, in some rare instances, the infection can spread to the epididymis, which is the tube from the testes that carry sperm, causing general pain and, in some rare cases, sterility among men. For women, however, a range of complications can occur since chlamydia can spread from the cervix to the uterus or fallopian tubes. In 40% of the untreated cases among women, these patients contract PID, or pelvic inflammatory disease. PID can lead to permanent damage of the reproductive organs, which in turn causes things like chronic pain, infertility, or pregnancy outside of the uterus called ectopic pregnancy, which can be fatal. Also, in pregnant women with chlamydia, the disease can be passed from mother to child during a vaginal birth. Now, for a newborn baby, this can cause a myriad of complications, including things like pneumonia and pink eye. In very rare instances, arthritis, skin lesions, swelling of the eyes, or urethra can also be caused from exposure to chlamydia. For all you gentlemen out there, I want you to stay with me for a second and imagine you're Johnson and the I think that's enough. So
so what some of the, what they described here is going to be common for every STI. And so some of the commonalities pay attention to as we're going through this, and then we'll review them at the end. And uh, hint, this is part, some of this will be on your test in terms of the commonality. But the first one, uh, and I think the most important one, is that you don't know you have it. So gonorrhea, uh, very common also. Uh, large numbers uh, have uh, exist in terms of gonorrhea. Uh, less than half of uh, gonorrhea cases are reported to the CDC, again, because we don't always know that we have it. After uh, several years of stable gonorrhea rates, uh, we still see that they have been increasing and it's cephalosporin resistance. So that's another key uh, idea behind a lot of our STIs, and that is that for bacteria STIs, so uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and other bacteria, we have antibiotics that can treat them and cure them, right? But the, uh, the bacteria can be very smart and mutate, as you heard, other diseases and, that, and their bacteria mutating so that our antibiotics don't work with them anymore. And we're, we're pretty good, we're pretty smart about keeping up and developing new antibiotics, but there is a lag time sometimes. Some uh, uh, men may have no symptoms. Uh, they may appear two to five days or up to 30 days after exposure. Signs and symptoms, pain um, or burning when urinating in a white, yellow, or green discharge, uh, painful testicles. Female signs, vaginal bleeding between your periods, pain or burning, discharge, more discharge, and the discharge can have an odor to it. And kind of the same places that it, it can occur in your body. Often called the clap. Um, uh, again, for women, uh, you can get PID <coughs> from this, and men, you can get epididymitis, and it can cause very painful burning and infertility. So some of the same serious side effects for gonorrhea, chlamydia are going to be consistent through all STIs. <coughs> uh, how's it diagnosed? You get a blood sample or a urine sample and or swabs. And the treatment, <coughs> again, is an antibiotic. Here's another common kind of thing to know about when you're taking an antibiotic. Some people are not uh, very disciplined about it and will forget it a day or say, oh, I don't, I don't have any symptoms after five days and you're supposed to be on it 10 days, so I think I'll stop taking it. If you stop taking an antibiotic before the course is completed, uh, the way it's prescribed, your condition can come back. And then it's harder to treat. Syphilis, uh, another bacterial uh, condition treated with antibiotics. Uh, again, symptoms often not noticed. It can lead, uh, so syphilis has a time period and early symptoms are not that serious. Later symptoms can get very serious. So it can lead to blindness, paralysis, death uh, if it's not treated. Uh, first sign is typically a painless sore in the genitals anal area. It's round and firm. A rash can develop later. Uh, other signs and symptoms, enlarged lymph nodes, uh, here, here, fever, fatigue, hair loss, and it can affect the brain in late stages. <coughs> so we'll go on to viruses. The herpes virus, so very common <coughs> among um, young people, old people, middle-aged people. And the first one is herpe herpes simplex 1, so that's what we get on our lips. Um, herpes simplex 2 is what uh, we typically get in the genital area. Again, huge numbers. Uh, the statistics are kind of blinding. Uh, lots of new cases each year, and uh, pregnant women do show up with herpes, and it can be uh, herpes that they've had from before that shows up, you know, while they're while they're pregnant. 
So uh, re reoccurrent attack of eruptions. So you, if anybody's had a cold sore, you know people that have cold sores, they're very painful. <coughs> so if you have herpes in the vaginal or, or on the penis, uh, it's also very painful. Women have a hard time urinating because it can be very painful. Common in both men and women. There's no cure for this. It's contagious, obviously. Um, and the important thing, this is what's kind of scary about our viruses, and that is that before they even show up, we're shedding them. So you kind of in a, we're in a very difficult place in our society, in our world, in our humanity, in uh, some of these situations. Uh, and then um, while it's dripping or, or draining any kind of sore, uh, that drainage is infectious. Most people who have GH don't even know that they have it. Again. So the herpes sores on the lips and genital area can be spread back and forth. So if you're having oral sex and you have any um, uh, herpes simplex one on your lip, that could be transmitted to the perineal area or to the penis. Uh, it can be transmitted during intercourse, if, even if you don't know that you have it. Sharing lipstick, cigarettes, and glasses are obviously not a smart thing to do if you know you have something going on. <clears throat> so I think I talked a little bit about the symptoms, but blisters and bumps, and you've se probably seen them on everybody, been able to observe them on somebody um, who has cold sores. They're painful and itchy, headache, fever, vaginal discharge, muscle ache, lower back pain. <coughs> uh, again, these symptoms are very common for all STIs. The treatment antiviral medicines, so uh, aslico, acyclovar is uh, pretty common and most, most doctors will offer that to you if you have herpes going on. For young people, like if this is a teenager and they're coming in with their first STI and the GYN doctor has seen them, they will put them on acyclovar because it is possible and, and does happen sometimes that getting it that early into that young of a person can stop the disease and they may not uh, have another outbreak ever. Uh, they might, but it's possible that they won't. And then for anybody else that has herpes, um, acyclovar would be um, probably prescribed if you wanted it. Then uh, the rest, Advil, Tylenol, sits bath, hair dryer. Again, the perineal area is very sore if you have herpes sores out, so um, wiping it with a towel can just be painful. And wear cotton underpants. <coughs> HPV. <coughs> so we, uh, in the medical field, we talk about all these things being in epidemic proportions. And again, staggering numbers. Uh, there's a lot of strains of HPV, so about one third of them can be transmitted sexually. Uh, they show up as genital warts, and they can cause cervical cancer and penile cancer. And uh, I think there's there's a number of different strains that are primary for cervical cancer. So 60 identified virus varieties. Oh, we already did this slide. Why is it not moving? What? Oh, okay. So uh, women do die of cancer caused by HPV. A thousand men get HPV related cancer of the penis each year anal cancer. So the warts in women appear on, the, appear on the vulva, vaginal area, anus, and cervix. And for the men, shaft, scrotum, anus. Let's see this. Hopefully this one works out better. 
when you raise your right hand, you're writing a blank check for your body. You're giving it to your country. Effect. Veteran sacrifice. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and today I'm reviewing the vaccine for the human papillomavirus. Now that might not sound too, too fascinating, but believe me it is. This is a story that involves sex, parts of your body we don't often talk about, human relationships, warts, our immune system, and unfortunately, cancer. So there will definitely be TMI here, but I, I think the better you understand something, the better your decision. And I say decision because the question I want to look at today is, should you or, or someone you care about get the HPV vaccine? So let's start with some background. Our story begins with the common wart. Now, most of us have had one on a finger or a foot, and warts are caused by a virus, what we call the human papillomavirus, or, or HPV for short. Now, we can get warts on any part of our body, including, and, and here comes the TMI part, our genitalia or our anus, and, and by genitalia, I mean the vagina in woman and the penis in men. The vagina also has different parts to it. So, for example, the front part, the vulva, or the part that's farther inside, the cervix. In the past, nobody thought much about warts. I mean, we knew we transferred warts to one another, and, and some people didn't like the way they looked, but in the last few decades, we have figured out that certain cancers, such as cervical, vaginal, vulvar, anal, penile, and even some throat cancers can be caused by HPV. For example, 99% of cervical cancer is caused by HPV, as well as approximately 90% of anal cancers and 35% and of penile cancers. What is not commonly known is that about 75% of sexually active people have HPV by the time they're 50. The good news is that most of the time our bodies actually fight off HPV, just like any other virus. But about 10 to 20% of the time the infection persists. The realization that most warts are harmless, but some warts or, or HPV can cause some types of cancer led to an aha moment. Researchers said, hey, if you can give vaccines for viruses like the flu or, or hepatitis, then maybe we can create a vaccine for HPV and save people from these cancers before they happen. And that's exactly what did happen. Today there are two vaccines available for HPV. One is called Gardasil and the other is Cervarix. There happen to be over a hundred different types of HPV viruses, but the two that cause 70% of cervical cancer are strains known as number 16 and number 18. Two other types, number 6 and number 11, cause about 90% of plain old non-cancerous genital warts. So not dangerous, but not exactly the highlight of your week. Gardasil protects against all four of these strains, so it protects against plain genital warts as well. Whereas Cervix focuses just on those that can cause cancer. Both vaccines require three separate shots that are administered over a period of six months. Vaccines for cancer, I mean, that's pretty cool, you gotta admit. The main target of these vaccines is to prevent cervical cancer in women, as it's the most prevalent of the cancers caused by HPV. In Canada, about 1 in 150 women develop cervical cancer, and about 423 women die from it every year. Worldwide, this translates to over a quarter of a million deaths a year. The best time to receive the HPV vaccine is before a person becomes sexually active, to prevent HPV infection before it happens. That is why school programs aim to vaccinate girls in grades 5 or 6 or 7 or 8. And, and because the peak risk for HPV is in the first 5 to 10 years of sexual experience, the window for receiving the vaccine continues to be open even after sexual activity begins. Now, I can focus in on the experience of females, but there is an emerging research on whether males should receive the vaccine. Males are a major source of female infections and vice versa, so vaccinating young males would not only protect them against HPV, but would also prevent much of the infection in females. Males who have sex with males are at higher risk of anal cancer, and the HPV vaccine could protect them. Okay, so that's a backgrounder. The next question is, how effective are these vaccines? I think it depends on how you define effective. When we look at the immune response, most trials show almost 100% effectiveness against the two viruses that cause 70% of cervical cancer. Ah, but what about the other 30% you might ask? And you would be right to ask. The vaccine does not prevent against all cervical cancer, which is exactly why women who do receive the vaccine still need to have regular pap tests. When we look beyond just immune response towards data and reducing actual rates of cervical and other cancers, we need to understand that it may take up to 20 years for HPV to produce cervical cancer. However, most HPV vaccination programs did not start till after 2007, which means we haven't had a lot of time to properly demonstrate an actual drop in disease. 
Early data, especially from Australia and the US, shows a reduction in the signs of early cancer, as well as reduced rates of genital warts and reduced need for procedures to assess and treat cervical cancer, such as repeat pap smears, colposcopies, and biopsies. As well, for women that have already tested positive for HPV in the past, taking the vaccine actually helped reduce further HPV infection. So I suppose the next question is, what's the downside to getting the vaccine? Vaccine reporting systems, which collect adverse events and then analyze any worrisome patterns, have signaled possible neurological disease, blood clots, and even death. But when these serious events are analyzed by expert groups, they have showed no obvious clustering to suggest causality, meaning they most likely happen by chance or for some other reason. There is one exception, as one Australian review signaled a higher rate of anaphylaxis than we have typically seen, about 2.6 per 100,000 people vaccinated. Anaphylaxis can be treated, but it's a serious allergic reaction that leads to rash, throat swelling, and low blood pressure. This rate is extremely rare, but it's being followed up now. Another way to assess side effects is by following people during research trials. In the case of the HPV vaccine, this method shows that about 74% has some kind of reaction to the vaccine, but interestingly, so did 64% of people who got the placebo. So people had headaches, fever, nausea, but about the same rate whether they got the HPV or fake shot. The outcome that differed most between the two groups was mild to moderate injection site reactions. About two out of three people reported mild to moderate pain, redness, and swelling. These reactions, along with the occasional fainting, are pretty classic when we inject people as they are a downside to injectable vaccines in general. They usually disappear in two days. So far, after 10 years of clinical trials, there is no evidence that a booster dose will be necessary. So, how many people in here have had the vaccine? That's great. And nobody has any qualms about doing that for their children? Yeah. So, it's pretty important. And some of the um, side effects that have been, that he showed, you know, it has been proven that uh, those shots are pretty safe. And anybody that has had had those extreme uh, events, something else was going on with them. There was another condition that they had or whatever that uh, was found to be the cause of that. <coughs> so HIV, AIDS, to go over a couple things about this. So HIV viruses progressively uh, kill or destroy our T cells, which are a major part of our immune system, and that leads to infections, and that's what generally causes death for people that have AIDS. Uh, without treatment, um, HIV usually uh, develops into AIDS in about 10 years, and then one in six people uh, with AIDS don't know that they have it. Again, staggering statistics worldwide, although we're making progress with HIV. Some global numbers, uh, this only goes up to 2009, but continuing to grow, particularly in um, our third world countries. So how is it transmitted? Uh, again, with blood semen, vaginal secretions, breast milk. Uh, mainly transmitted still through male uh, homosexual contact, although it, it's uh, healthy in our heterosexual contact as well. So uh, heterosexuals, gay bisexual men, Uh, drug, uh, gay and bisexual men who also inject drugs and then drug users because they get infected through blood. And this just uh, gives you a breakdown by race and ethnicity. So people often, uh, particularly when AIDS first came out, but it's still a question for people that are involved with people that they know have AIDS, or uh, HIV is probably the more prevalent level that people know people at. But anyway, no risk <coughs> unless a sore is present. So dry kissing, um, uh, I'm not 
sure what that, why that's there, but anyway. So in terms of touching somebody that has HIV or AIDS, dry kissing, no problem, <coughs> body to body rubbing and massage, bathing and showering together, saliva, sweat and tears, insects, um, probably no risk, shaking hands and sharing dishes. Then moderate or low, uh, low risk, uh, so wet kissing, oral sex, uh, vaginal and anal intercourse, transfusions. Transfusions were a big problem when this first started, but they have uh, gotten the testing perfected so that it's not a problem now. Contact between broken skin and wounds, pre-chewed food, tattooing and body piercing. And then higher risk, um, vaginal or anal intercourse with no protection or improper use of protection. Needles is very high risk, multiple partners, infected mother at birth. Early symptoms, early most people have don't have much in terms of symptoms. It takes about six months to develop and so if you feel like you've been exposed, you won't know for sure that you haven't picked this up uh, for six months. So fever, rashes, uh, swollen lymph nodes, fatigue after a few weeks, night sweats, these are later symptoms, dry cough, shortness of breath, weight loss. So treatment, there's no cure, but there are a number of drugs. I think now, when we first started with drugs with people with HIV, uh, it was scads of drugs, you know, it was eight, nine that they had to take. It's down to three or four now. Uh, they have to be taken every day for the rest of the person's life. And uh, the point is to keep infections down within the body. This is a new treatment, uh, PrEP Truvada. Somebody in the class asked about this. And the idea behind this is that you take it before you are diagnosed with HIV. So this is somebody that has been cleared and they're not, they don't currently have HIV. So a very <coughs> exposure prophylaxis and what they're doing is taking two HIV drugs, uh, which blocks HIV replication from occurring and prevents HIV from establishing infections in the body. It's a prevention strategy and has to be taken every day. And for people who take seven pills per week, uh, their estimated level of protection is 99%. <coughs> Every day that you don't take it, uh, you have a higher risk of being exposed. So four prep pills per week, 96% to 76%. So <clears throat> what are some of the commonalities you've heard about STIs? A lot of them you don't know you have. It. Yeah. And most of the effects are same, so you don't know which is going to be which strain you have of the CDC virus. True. Mm -hmm. Yes. They, sh they share quite a few symptoms. Yes, they share the symptoms. Anything else? <coughs> you remember? So they all they all affect the all of our mucous membranes. Often no symptoms, somebody said common symptoms, um, can be transmitted, uh, can be tested, they all can be tested, S uh, some cured uh, or symptoms, some are, are curable or symptoms are managed and prevention works. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the prevention side of this. I have a <coughs> little condom here. <laughs> So shaving, uh, this is something that we often don't think about, but uh, this goes to sharing things with your partners and with people that you're living with. So we had a student in class one time that wrote us a letter after the fact that said she had been at her, bo her boyfriend's house and she went to uh, shave her legs and uh, she picked up his father's razor by accident and ended up with her piece. So, because when you shave, 
And so this is something to think about when we're um, shaving our perineal area, um, escaping, you know, doing our scaping, that when you uh, shave with a razor, your uh, skin pores are open for 72 hours. When you um, wax, they're open for at least 48 hours. So that means that they're very susceptible, when your skin pores are open, they're very susceptible to receiving any germ that comes along the way. And so you may want to shave and then 24 hours go out and have later and have sex, but um, just be aware of that and that there's different ways that these things can be communicated or contacted. So condoms, this is not new news for anybody. Um, but check the date, check the integrity. Don't use one, uh, use a new one for every sexual contact. And they need to be not, they can't be kept in a warm place, like in your pocket, in your wallet. They need to be stored in a relatively cool place. Right size. So if you don't have the right size for your penis, it's going to slip off and, and it's not going to work. Uh, there's different kinds, oral, female, anal, uh, and there's different barriers to use. And they're available at the SSU Health Center. So this is one thing I like to talk about. If you know that you're going out tonight with the intention of <coughs> drinking and maybe hooking up with somebody, then think about this beforehand. Are you, do you think you're gonna have sex or not? If you are, if you think that you're probably gonna end up that way, make sure you have your protection with you. So not too many people know or think about female condoms, so here's a, this is a video about how to use one and what they are. The FC female condom, created by the female health company, is a condom that is made to be worn on the inside of the body. Before opening the female condom, check the expiration date printed on its package and check the package for any holes or tears. If the expiration date has passed or the package has been damaged, throw it away and begin again with a new female condom. Before opening the FC female condom, gently rub the package to make sure the lubricant is spread evenly. Following the arrow, open the package carefully with your fingers. Take the female condom out of its package and you will see a thick inner ring and a thin outer ring. The inner ring is used for insertion and to help hold the condom in place during intercourse. The outer ring will remain on the outside of the body, covering the area around the vaginal opening. Before inserting the female condom, find a position that is comfortable for you. You may squat, stand with one leg up on a chair, sit, or lie down. A partner may also help you insert the female condom. While holding the female condom at the closed end, squeeze the inner ring and then gently insert it into the vagina. Using your finger, locate the inner ring and push it up as far as it will go until it rests against the cervix. Be sure that the condom is not twisted. The thin outer ring should remain on the outside of the vagina. As every woman's body is different, it may take practice to insert the female condom correctly. As it will become much easier with repeated use, we strongly recommend that women practice inserting and removing the female condom before using one for the first time during sexual activity. The female condom can be inserted prior to foreplay and intercourse, enabling you to be both safe and spontaneous. When you are ready, gently guide your partner's penis into the female condom's opening. Be sure that the penis is not entering on the side between the condom and the vaginal wall. The penis must be completely surrounded by the female condom. To remove the female condom, twist the outer ring and then gently pull the condom out, then place it in a waste bin. Each female condom can only be used one time. You must remove and dispose of the used female condom and insert a new one before beginning sexual activity again. <coughs> So obviously not quite as easy to use as uh, the condom on the penis, 
but if uh, I would I would recommend that women carry one in case you have a situation where you want to have sex and the guy doesn't want to wear a condom um, and also if you uh, think you want to do this really pay attention to the fact that you need to practice it at home first um, you don't want to be in the bathroom struggling with it in the heat of the moment. So dental dams or oral condoms for use with oral sex or anal sex. because it doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel natural. Uh, that's always going to be, but with every, all the STIs that are around, what's the better option? And once you, if you get into a habit of using them, uh, it wouldn't be as bad. It, it would feel more natural. So this is another fun, uh, fun this is more fun <coughs> video. 
So ladies, if you uh, would learn how to do this or are interested in learning how to do this, there's tons of videos out there about it. Mm -hmm. But it's a real turn on. It's an easy way to get a condom on a guy. And so that's learning how to put it on with your mouth. So here's a demonstration about that. Mm -hmm. solutions and I just want to show you how to put a condom on with your mouth correctly. Well first what you need to do is get a condom. Flavor condoms are the best. You can come in any type of flavor, chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, whatever you like. This one I'm using is chocolate. So what you want to do is open the condom up completely and then you want to place the condom on your two thumbs as if it's a hat. It should be able to roll down but do not roll it down. Meaning this ridge here should be up. Then what you're going to do is take the tip of your tongue, place it to the tip of your thumbs, this bubble that's sticking up, you're actually going to push that down with your tongue like this. Then you're going to take the condom and just place it over your tongue completely. And then close your mouth. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take your man, and of course I'm using a dildo right now, and then you're going to make a seal. You're going to take the tip of your tongue with the condom on it to the head of his penis. Then you're going to take your lips and your tongue and just literally push his penis, I mean the condom down to his penis. So I'm going to show you how it's going to look, but I'm also going to have a little sound effect. It's just a little gagging, because gagging always makes things do better. So here I go. conditions and if you've been out having sex then you should be getting tested monthly you know if you're not having sex for a period of time or you're having sex with a consistent partner uh, you can get tested a little less frequently but even if you're having sex with a consistent partner it's a good idea to get tested every once in a while because STIs can show up later than you think and then definitely with every new partner What about uh, telling and communicating about the fact that you have an STI? How do you feel about that? Isn't it like required by the law? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a legal <coughs> situation now if you have an STI from somebody else and they catch it. Uh, you can be convicted for that. But beyond that, what do you think about telling? Why don't people tell? Let me put it that way. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Right. It's kind of like a, like coming out to someone. There's yeah. a lot of like repercussions from it. How many of you, uh, if you knew somebody had, in my I, I just see it as completely 
this one is too blinding. You, you, you've done this to a, someone who's completely unaware of it, and whether you learn about it after or not, it's now your responsibility to inform them so they can make further safe decisions. And if you don't do that, you're not hindering their life, and that's, that's the night. Yeah, you're dramatically affecting somebody else's life. If you knew somebody had an STI, how many of you would have sex with them? <laughs> Does that speak to you about why people don't tell? Yeah. But for all of the other reasons that we just talked about, it's extremely important to tell your partner. And if you're in a new relationship, you should just have a discussion about it. Okay. That's it. Be smart. <laughs>